Hello everyone, welcome to the 50th webinar in 12D's training webinar series. My name is Lisa Stewart and I'm the Marketing and Communications Coordinator at 12D Solutions. 12D's training webinars showcase common industry challenges, taking a close look at industry best practices and how these can be implemented using 12D products. The aim of these webinars is to upskill 12D users and broaden their understanding of the capabilities of 12D products. We run these webinars regularly and record them for posting through our website and on YouTube. The first 49 webinars from this training series, as well as the webinars from our Industry Solutions series, are available on our YouTube channels if you missed those. During this presentation you'll be able to type your questions along the way, as shown on the screen, and we'll answer as many as possible throughout the webinar. At the end I'll also send through your questions to the presenter for his insights. Today's webinar, Demystifying Track Terminology, will be presented by Alastair McRudden, who first started using 12D model, or rather 4D model as it was known then, in 1996. From 1997 he ran 12D training courses through a reseller, and then in 1998 he commenced contracting directly to 12D, and has run our WA support and training ever since. Alistair's vast rail experience includes heavy rail in northwestern Australia and Africa, port facilities relating to rail and ports interface, and passenger rail. He is loath to be call an, called an expert in this topic, but we certainly think the term is apt. In today's webinar, Alistair will take you through the terminology associated with using 12D track in order to demystify rail design, which he says is not actually too different from road design. Over to you, Alistair. Thanks, Lisa. In this session, we're going to be looking at some terminology on track just to, so we can demystify the, the design. Rail design is not that different from road design, and a competent road designer will easily switch to rail design with the guidance of a rail engineer or an experienced rail designer. Here's a description of some of the commonly used terms. As per highway design, Railways use horizontal transitions at the start and end of curves. The trains generally have fixed axles, and so these transitions ease them into the curve. The type of transitions may vary in different countries and states, and for heavy, light, or high-speed trains. Here is a typical cross-section through a rail embankment and track. So the orange line at the bottom would be where your existing ground is, probably been cleaned and grubbed down to that level. The for formation then is build material that is of suitable use for this sort of construction and then the capping layer on the top is a condensed hardened layer which will actually work to shed the water off the formation. Now in this case it's actually been drawn totally flat which wouldn't normally be the case. It would either be crowned in the middle or it would have a one-way crossfall so that the drainage would work. Sitting on top of the capping layer you have your ballast, and then on top of that your sleepers with pandrel plates and rails attached to the top. So the idea is that any water that hits the ballast will soak through the ballast onto the capping layer, and from there it will be shed off down the sides and away. The gauge. The gauge is the distance from the top inner edge of the left rail to the top inner edge of the right rail. The gauges vary from country to country and, for example in Australia, from state to state. Gauges vary hugely from 600 millimetres, sometimes smaller, particularly if you're talking about model railways, to 2140 millimetres. Some common gauge designations are narrow, which is generally 1067 millimetres, standard, around about the 1435 millimetres, and broad gauge, which would be 1,676 millimetres. Some examples of localities using these gauges are narrow gauges commonly used in Western Australia, Queensland, Tasmania, New Zealand, South Africa. Of course, there are sites within each of these regions that may use other gauges as well. Meter gauge, which is obviously 1,000 millimetres, is included in this set and is, was, widely used by European colonial powers, that's British, French, German generally, across Europe and Africa, plus Malaysia, Thailand, etc. Standard gauge, 
which as we saw from above is around about the 1,435 millimeters, is the most common gauge worldwide. And then we have broad gauge, which is commonly used in the Indian subcontinent and parts of the USA. These locations are mentioned merely as a bit of a guide here. Most likely, there will be more than one gauge to use in the majority of them, and there are other gauges that haven't even been mentioned. Now there can be a problem if a single location uses more than one gauge, because the rolling stock, which is the locomotives and wagons, etc., will need to be changed from one gauge to another. An example of this is in Western Australia, which uses narrow and standard gauges. For many years, this was certainly the case at Kalgoorlie, where trains from the east, which used standard gauge, were unloaded and then reloaded onto narrow gauge trains at the Kalgoorlie station. So what's the solution to this? Dual gauge track. The idea here, as you can see from the image, is that on each sleeper you have three rails. So the one rail is, is used commonly for both narrow gauge and standard gauge that allows trains from the eastern states to run right the way through to Perth in WA but the local narrow gauge stock can still use the same routes. Now this isn't only done in Western Australia, that was just an example that I was using there. On to the design centre line. Horizontal design is generally on the centre line of the track which is of course halfway between the two rails and vertically it's on what's normally termed top of low rail or TLR. We then introduce cant. So as the track goes around a corner, the rail on the outer edge of the curve lifts up, which is what the cant is. So basically super elevation for rails. The inner rail will always stay at the original or low height, hence the term top of low rail. So whenever you take a, a, a corner either to the left or the right, one rail will stay at the low level and that is the top of low rail, which is the design criteria. The cant is then applied in much the same manner as super elevation is, from the centre line to either the left or the right side. Unlike road carriageways, there is no surface between the left and right rails, Therefore, the broken grade at the centre line is of no consequence and the train wheels span from one rail to the other. Of course, there is transitions, so transitions up from rails being equal height, gent gently lifting until you've reached your maximum cant, and then of course at the other end of the curve, as you start to drop back down, it will transition back down again. When it comes to actually applying this, I normally run two functions for the job. They are both run from the center line. The function for the rails I usually run later, and that's after the cant has all been de defined. And what that means is that the rails will then be plotted with their true height on each of the rails. As I said, that comes later. Normally the first function that you will run is to produce the formation and the capping. Originally, the capping was done as boxing, but more commonly now it's done as a tri-mesh. I apply the formation template with a height hinge modifier to suit the combined depth of the rail, the pandrel plate, which is a plate that goes between the rail and the sleepers, the sleeper, and the ballast. So you get a maximum height of, say, around about 850 millimeters for a heavy gauge rail. The reason for doing this is that if the rail design changes horizontally and or vertically as you progress the design, the formation will automatically follow it at the correct height below the center line. On to intersections. Intersections, which of course we don't really have in rail, are referred to as crossovers and turnouts. The crossovers are the links between one track and another to enable the train to change lanes. And the turnouts are the switches that allow the train to go straight or turn from one track onto the crossover and then at the other end turn back off the crossover onto the next track. The turnouts are usually designed and manufactured by specialist companies 
and are designated as, say, a 1 in 10, a 1 in 12, 1 in 20, etc., which defines the deflection angle for a particular turnout. Turnouts are preferably placed on straights. The cost for this is significantly less, but they can be placed on curves if needed, and that's when you'll be pleased that you've got element design super alignments. Now the reason they're normally placed on straights is that it is a far simpler switch and turnout set that you can put into, into place there and there's less wear and tear on the element. As I said, not to say you can't have them, but in general you would prefer to have them on a straight. I've also got a typical drawing of a turnout here that would normally be supplied by the turnout manufacturer and would specify all the geometry for the particular turnout. It's also highly desirable to have the turnouts on a single grade vertically. Remember that the switches are moving parts. So again, it is possible to have them in a vertical curve. You would only want a, a very marginal vertical curve. But again, most rail stuff is fairly marginal in that the grades are, are fairly uh, gentle. But they will be far more expensive to manufacture for a, for a vertical curve. And they will wear far more quickly than if they are on a single grade. You're generally talking about millions of dollars per turnout here, so this is why you want to try and keep the costs as low as possible, and you can do that by keeping your horizontal and vertical on simple geometry if possible. The last item I'll mention in this presentation is curve compensation. In general terms, a train is dragged along by the locomotive. Commonly, though certainly not always at the front of a chain of carriages, now, if you're working with heavy rail, you may well end up with a configuration of two or three locos at the front of the train, two or three locos in the middle of the carriages, and another two or three locos possibly at the end of the carriages. So when the train starts to climb and incline, the loco has to increase its power output to maintain its speed as more and more of the carriages enter the inclined section of track. Because of this, the basis of design for the track and loco sets would define the maximum allowable grade for the job. So hopefully that part is clear enough. But if there's a curve in the section of track that is on an incline or near the beginning of the incline, then this introduces additional friction to the load for the loco to pull. And that is what curve compensation is all about. I won't bother with the formula here, but in simple terms, for each degree of horizontal deflection of the curve, you need to reduce the climbing grade so you get a compensated grade which would match an uncurved grade and therefore equate back to the basis of the design. So if you're on, a, on an incline and you have a curve in that incline, you would then have to reduce your, your climbing grade so that the power output would still be matched and you wouldn't lose significant speed on those inclines. So that's all I have on the terminology part of this presentation. We're going to move on now to another part. So now I'd like to move on to a snippet that I've written to produce a decisional cut and fill template that can be used not only for rail, it could also be used for, for road work, but uh, in this particular case we're going to use it for rail. This is what the snippet will do for us. So it's, this is whole of this uh, rail formation, all of the cut batters, all of the fill batters, and that includes cut off drains and berms, safety berms, etc., have all been produced by one template on the left and one template on the right, and then with a snippet of the cut and fill on the left and one snippet for the cut and fill on the right hand side. Just another view here. What I've done, if you have a look at this, you'll see that I've actually used the snippet on the left and the right with different variables on them. So for instance, uh, in this portion over here, where we've got what I've classed as the shallow fill, it's much wider and not as deep as it is on the right hand side over here where it's narrower but much deeper. Similar things are occurring up at the top end up here where we get into the 
cut portion. So how does it work? Well, all the design strings are inserted as fixed decisional modifier in the snippet, or of course they could be done in an MTF. This whole thing could have been done purely as an MTF. But because they've been put in as fixed decisional modifiers, it means that you can go back and modify them at any time you require. So for example, you can vary a drain's depth or modify it from a V-drain to a trapezoidal drain by inserting an extra link, and then widen it and grade it to suit. This sort of thing was always a stumbling block in the old decisional portion of the templates, which were of course prior to version 11, as once you'd created those links, you really couldn't modify them much. So how does this one work? Well, we have a fill situation here. So the first portion is the primary portion of the template. Now that could of course be done as a template shape or as a snippet for the primary surface. And then this snippet that we're dealing with here, our decisional cut and fill is then tagged on to the primary surface last link. The fill template is then split up into two portions. There is a shallow fill portion, which I'm showing on the right hand side here with a flashing cursor. And that shallow fill is defined by a height and a slope. If you don't find the ground within that shallow fill portion, it then goes into a deep fill portion which has a batter, again defined by height and slope, and then a bench defined by the width and crossfall. So over here again on the right hand side, here's our, our batter there, and then we get to a bench. Now the deep fill portion is repeated as many times as needed after the shallow fill until it goes down and intersects to the ground down here. So onto the cut portion of the template. The primary surface for road or rail can again be placed by either a template or a snippet. So we're looking at that down here where my cursor is flashing at the moment. And then the cut template follows on from that. And it's split up into three portions. First of all, there is a V-drain. So that's down here, right next to the road or rail. And is defined by depth and a slope. As it exits that, it does one of two things. It either goes into a deep cut batter, which is defined by a height and a slope, which you can see here, and then it goes off to a cut bench, defined by width and crossfall. If it doesn't meet those um, criteria, then what's happening is it's coming up here to the shallow cut. Now this is defined by a depth below ground level, so that you can change your your final cut in there if your material is softer and you don't want it falling into the, into the cutting. So the idea here, as I've set up the, at the top here, is this is the, the shallow cut, and that is defined by a depth below ground and a batter. So presuming that we haven't hit that, we're down here again, and what it's going to do is it's going to go and run through those deep cut batters and benches until such, such time as it hits this position here, where it finds the specified depth below the ground. Then it will invoke the shallow cut. Then, if specified, it creates a safety berm at the top of the cutting. The reason we want that, of course, is that if we've got a deep cutting in there, you might decide at a certain depth you want to have a uh, safety berm there so people aren't likely to drive a vehicle or something into a deep cutting. So you can then go and specify your safety berm defining it by height, width at the top, etc, etc, and side slopes. Then the last thing that it does in there is it produces a cutoff drain if the ground is falling away from the berm, it will not need one. If the ground is falling towards the berm, then it will put in the safety berm for us. Now, usually when we're making a snippet, we try to keep the snippet panels as small as possible so that they're easy to use and there are not too many fields in them. However, in this one, as you can see, I've failed. 
I had a lot of stuff to put into it, so that's why it's not as simple as some of them would, would be or, what, or we would like it to be. But it does have a hell of a lot going on in, in with it, inside it, so it's got to be worth it. This one panel does all of the work of selecting cut and fill with as many batters and benches as it needed to suit the terrain model automatically. Let's see it in action now. Okay, so here we are inside 12D. So I've got my perspective view here, obviously. This first portion running across here is the formation for the rail. Once we hit uh, this point here, that's when we get into our shallow fill. Then we come down in a deep fill batter, deep fill bench, deep fill batter, and it repeats that as it needs it. As we can see further along the rail here, we get into a little bit of a cutting there and it makes its decisions. And then as we get up here, it gets deeper and deeper, etc. So let's go and have a look at this in a bit more detail. So obviously a perspective view up here. This is a plan view here with a little bit of the job that we're looking at at the moment. A longitudinal section there. And up here we've got a cross section. Now the moment, as we'll see in a moment, when, when I pull up the panels, you'll see that we've got the same settings on each side of that uh, center line. It's just that on this side it doesn't need as much of the template as it does on this side, so it stops it short once it gets that cover to the ground. Let's go and have a look at what they do. So this one over here is the left-hand side modifier that attaches the template. Over here, of course, the right-hand side, and at the moment those settings are the same. So what I'm going to do is I'll just pop this one down, I won't bother changing that one. I'll move this one across to the right a little bit, and we'll go and have a change of a couple of things in here. So I won't bother changing any of the uh, of the initial uh, templating up there for the formation. At the moment I won't change the V-drain either, we'll have a play with that a little bit later on. What I will do is I'll go into here and I'll go and change the deep cut better height to 5 and we'll put a slope on it of 0.75 so that'll, that should show up being quite different. The cut bench width will make that down to 3 and then what I'll do here is wouldn't normally do it, but just, just for demonstration purpose, I'll go and put that so that that's a, a positive three rise, which means that any runoff in there will actually run down the next embankment, which you probably really wouldn't want. That's probably going to achieve what I want for the moment. So we'll go and run that again, and just to bear in mind, these heights and slopes match one another. So when I go and apply this, it'll go and rerun that whole job for me. And you can see here that I've got a totally different look to the right hand side from what we had on the left hand side. So that's purely by changing a couple of those settings and of course I could do the same thing in, in a fill situation where we could go down and change the, the fill slopes to whatever we decided we wanted to. I uh, probably won't bother too much with the with this shallow but we'll go and put on this side here that we want to go three meters with a slope of one in 1.5 and we'll put a fill bench width in there, we'll leave it as, as 4 maybe. So we will then go and run that. And if we now just go and find a portion of this job where we're in fill on both sides, which I believe this part is, Yes, it is, but not probably deep enough. So we'll just move forward a couple of cross sections so we can start to see something happening. So over here you can see again that this is coming in at a different height and a different slope. So over here we've got a 50% with a batter distance of 8 meters. We zoom in over here. We've got a 66.666 with a distance of 4.5. So we can see that the whole project is just updating automatically like that, purely from those two lines. Okay, so now let's go back to a cut situation. So we'll just come and pick one of these cross sections around about here. So we've got a cut cross section in there, and we'll go and have a bit of a play with the drain and see what that does for us. So that particular line is fine, we won't bother changing that, we'll say OK there. We'll bring up the right hand side modifiers here, and I've got another 
three modifiers set up ready to run. So what they do at the moment, they are inactive. So this first one here goes and inserts an extra link into the V drain to make it a trapezoidal drain. The next one here goes and changes the depth of that trapezoidal drain. And then the last line here says go and re-implement the finding the ground at the end of it. Because we've pushed it down further, it'll need to then go and change that final batter. So we'll go and hit apply here. And what we can see over here now, just put that out, down out the way, if we zoom in here, what it's actually gone and done is instead of having the V drain as we had on this side with the set height on it that we did, we've now gone and got a trapezoidal drain in there. I've changed the depth on this one. I could of course change the depth on that one if I so wished. And then up the top here, it's come back up and re-interfaced up to there. So those last three lines that I put in there are modifying the decisional template which the whole crux of the uh, version 11 and 12 with that fixed decisional templating is now meaning that we can go and do those sorts of modifiers as we wish for stuff that's been already existing, run through decisions and go and change those decisions. So that completes my session. Probably all that remains for you to do now is to go out and have a play and enjoy it. Thanks for your attention. Back to you, Lisa. Thanks for that, Alistair. We've got some great trading courses coming up in Brisbane, Melbourne, Perth and more. The handout available on this webinar outlines what's in some of these, and you can register through the training page of our website or contact us by email for more information. The recording of this webinar will be available in coming days through our website and our YouTube channel. We'll keep you posted on our upcoming webinars through email and social media if you're subscribed. And if you need to contact us in the meantime, our details are on the screen now. That concludes our presentation for today. Thank you all for attending and we hope to see you at future webinars.